Okay, well, it's a great pleasure to be giving this talk. Thanks very much for, for the invitation. Um, before I get going on what I, I, I prepared, I, I'd just like to say a little bit about Rudy Piles, because Rudy, Rudy and I actually overlapped a little bit when I was a, a, a very young man. One day in the coffee room in Keeble Row, uh, we discovered that we'd been reading the same paper in Physical Review. And this was at a time when, when grand unified theories had recently been invented, and they predicted that the proton would decay. Uh, and people had started to do experiments looking for proton decay. And of course, the, the decay was not detected at the rate which was pr predicted by, by these early versions of, of grand unified theories. And uh, two, two people from a university, which had better remain nameless, had written a paper explaining some bizarre quantum mechanical effect which meant that in these experiments the decay rate was, was suppressed. Rudy and I discovered that both of us had been reading this paper and neither of us be believed the contents of this paper. And we wrote a very short rebuttal and sent it to Physical Review Letters. After about six weeks, uh, you know, stuff from the, from the editors came back um, and, and the, uh, the, you know, the authors had been sent this, of course, and objected to it virulently. And it had obviously also been sent to friends of the authors who also objected virulently. So the editors said, unfortunately, we can't publish this. Right? Um, Piles was, it was the only time I really saw him get steamed up. And, and uh, he wrote a letter which began, I learned quantum mechanics with Wolfgang Pauli. <laughs> The letter went off to the phys physical review letters. The comment was published. <laughs> but unfortunately, I lost the copy of the letter. So, so it may, it's possible I've still got it somewhere, but, but I can't find it. OK. So I'm going to talk about up-to-date times, although I, I will compare them a little bit, of course, to, to bygone times as, as we go along. Um, I'm going to start with big science. So, I think, uh, you know, it's often, you'll see where the argument is, 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 is drifting, but clearly science has changed a very great deal uh, in the last 30 or 40 years. And we now have these enormous international projects, um, of which ATLAS is one example. So this is one of the multi-purpose detectors that discovered the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And although scientists have worked together for a very long time, as, as we've heard, this is really something else. So this is a collaboration, which is something over 5,000 people are working on the same project. They come from nearly 200 institutions in nearly 40 countries uh, around the world. And uh, the timescales are also very, very long. So Oxford Physics started working on Atlas in 1992. Now, the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012. So it was a 20-year project to discover the Higgs boson. So the, the timescales are huge compared to, to, to the sorts of science which was being done in the 20s and 30s, and even in the 40s. I mean, the closest to it really, I guess, was the Manhattan Project, uh, but, but that was a sort of wartime emergency project. That was run on a completely different basis from civilian, some, from civilian science. Now, Oxford physicists played a big role in making the, the Large Hadron Collider uh, happen. Um, and uh, Chris, who will be talking to us later, was the Director General of CERN, who was largely responsible for that. Roger Cashmore uh, was uh, Director of Research at CERN, and also played a big, a big role in it. So as well as, uh, well as the Atlas Detector, in fact, that department, which was, which was generated after the Second World War, produced people who, were large, who, who had a good, great deal of responsibility for making one of the greatest experiments of our era take place. The, the other point I'd like to make is that when, when we talk about this being international in its operation, we don't just mean that somebody somewhere does this, and somebody somewhere else does that, and somebody over there does the third thing. If you look at the science groups in the Atlas collaboration, people are working on particular Higgs boson decays, for example, literally come from all over the world. They come from institutions all over the world. They're all mixed up. So they are working together in a, very, in a very strongly coupled way, and this is a, a highly organised, highly organised operation. So many of you have seen this uh, this this uh, <coughs> picture. This is a picture of the Atlas detector, kind of open. There's a man down there. I hope you can see it. And um, so one of the one of the bits which is in the middle is the semiconductor tracker. That's this thing here. This was built in Oxford. 
in the, Dennis Wil the basement of the Dennis Wilkinson building. Um, and it was built by the people who signed up to join the Atlas experiment in 1992. If you actually look at an event, so here's an event from the Atlas experiment, okay, and uh, I'm afraid this contrast is a bit poor, but in the middle is actually where the semiconductor tracker goes, and if you look very, this is a Higgs boson event, and if you look very carefully, you can see there are four tracks coming out. First, there's two coming in. Those are the those are the bit, those are the beam lines. Then there are two. There are these two tracks which come out here, which are muons. That's a mu plus mu minus pair. Okay. And then, if you look very very carefully, there's two blue tracks as well, and that's an e plus e minus pair. That's a Dalek pair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's a Dalek pair, not from the decay of a pi zero, which weighs about 150 MeV but from a Higgs boson, which weighs 125 G. But it's the same phenomenon. Now, that's a big example of science on a grand scale. Okay. Um, some, somebody asked me at lunchtime, actually, whether science was all like that these days, or, or whether, in fact, sort of small laboratory-based science still happened. Well, small laboratory-based science very much still happened, um, but even that is changing in, in, its, in, in its nature. So uh, if, you, uh, if you go over the road, uh, you'll find an outfit called the Network Quantum Information Technology Collaboration, NKIT for short. And this is a project which involves eight universities which are led by Oxford, and it builds on the development of quantum technology which has taken place in the Clarendon Laboratory and other places over the past uh, 25 years or so. And, and its aim is to construct an actual, actual demonstrator modular quantum compute engine. Now I choose this particular example because quantum computing was pretty much invented on the top floor of the Lindemann building okay, by Arthur Ecker and David Deutsch uh, in, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. They did this work which was purely theoretical um, they did it at the top of the Linden, Linden, Lindemann building. There's a little place up there with a sign on the door which says Centre for Quantum Computation or something like that. Right? It's basically a sitting room. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, that, at that point, it was, what they were doing was they were just looking at a completely different way of looking at quantum mechanics. That's really what it boiled down to. Not the way we were taught quantum mechanics, but a different way of understanding it, and a way of understanding it in terms of much more in terms of information rather than energy levels and stuff like that. Um, the 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 interesting thing about this is uh, that this was purely theoretical. It took something like 20 years for people really to develop laboratory-based technology, which could implement those ideas. Okay. A lot of that was done in Oxford. Uh, here's an example. This is kind of what it looks like. This is a guy called Chris Balance, who was responsible for one of the most recent iron trap qubits. And this is an enormous load of gubbins on an optical table in an air-conditioned, cooled, stable laboratory somewhere. All right. You can make quantum computers like this, okay? but you can't put quantum computers like this in satellites, in aircraft, and give them to people who are not experts, uh, you can't cart them around. Uh, you know, th th this is just laboratory-level experiment. And the whole aim of this, this program is actually to begin the process of... This actually I did get off the Amazon website. Right? Is to begin the process of turning that gubbins into something which is a product, which, which, which is a device which is usable by an end user who does not understand exactly how the insides work. Okay. Projects, like, projects like this you know, take enormous amounts of resources. The funding for this, for this project is about £38 million, pounds, but it's still basically small laboratory science. In fact, the idea is not to build something huge. You're taking something which is already laboratory size and trying to build versions of it which are much smaller and much more robust. Now, so th those are just uh, two, uh, two examples of the sorts of science which, which, uh, which go on these days, and they have this characteristic in common that if you look at the, if you look at the, the people involved, and here I tell you that the, 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 the team which is involved in doing this, and this is both postdoctoral staff and academic staff, 
It's about half and half UK people, um, and, and uh, so half UK and a quarter each EU and overseas nationals. And that's pretty typical uh, of the makeup of the physics department now. Well, you might say, uh, what about everything else you do? So let's just run very quickly through the sorts of science that we do in, 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 in physics at the moment. We've already talked about particle physics. That's big international science where people are working together across the globe. Accelerator science is much the same. Uh, accelerator science basically has two aspects to it. One is the big particle accelerators you think about, and they're things like the LHC. Uh, but also it's about the sorts of accelerators which are used in, in, in medical therapy machines, uh, in industrial applications. And uh, again, this is a very, this is a very international a very international subject. Astro and planetary physics obviously involves huge telescopes, satellites, stuff like that. Once again, it's international. People are working all the time with other people in different countries. We have a very strong semiconductor devices group in, in Oxford working on photovoltaics. If you, look at the, if you look at the makeup of the people in that group, it's much the same as NKIT. It's very similar in terms of nationality, where people come from. Quantum information, I already, I, I, I already mentioned. Quantum materials are, this is basically um, you know, materials whose weird properties uh, depend on quantum mechanical effects. So I, actually, they, they, they are the sort of modern day version of what Rudy Piles started to work on. Rudy Piles was one of the, as we've already heard, was one of the pioneers of the quantum theory of solids. Uh, these days, uh, you know, where the cutting edge is at, is that materials which, materials which do weird things when you stress them in various ways. So there are materials, for example, if you change the pressure on them, you can turn, turn superconductivity on and off. There are materials which you can turn from antiferromagnets into superconductors and things like that. So the, these are materials which have very interesting, fundament, very interesting fu functionality. They're very much a plaything in the laboratory at the moment, but they may well be the basis of you know, new generations of technology which will take over when the current silicon-based technologies, for example, run out of steam. Biophysics. When new people arrive in the physics department these days and I give one of the induction talks, I, I tell them that the way we define physics now is through areas of science where being a physicist can help you make a difference to progress that science. You don't define it as what's in a certain set of textbooks. And one of the, one of the, one of the very noticeable things about the physics department now, uh, compared to 30 or 40 years ago, uh, is that subjects like biophysics have put in an appearance. And this is really where people who are physicists, people who have the background and the way of thinking about physics, are, are now working on biological systems, on, on the properties of biological systems, how, how to understand them, how to manipulate them, and so forth. Climate physics is another example of the same. Okay. Oxford's actually rather unusual in having a climate physics group. Usually people do climate in, in, in meteorology departments and things like that, if you look across, across the globe. Um, it's by very, it's very definition a global enterprise. Yeah. It's uh, uh, trying to understand what the, you know, the down, downstream fate of the climate and the atmosphere and the oceans will be. And then lastly, plasma physics. And, and plasma physics is interesting because we do plasmas in all sorts of environments. But again, basically, it's a very international thing. The big, big lasers are used to drive, to drive plasmas. Plasmas appear in astrophysical contexts. You could create the conditions inside the sun in a, in a, in a big laser system. All of these things, those things are again big laboratory. So there's a huge range of stuff which is done in the physics department from things which depend on big international laboratories to things which are still done in small labs. And there's a big range between people who are experimentalists, people who are ast uh, uh, in astronomy observers, and people like myself who are theorists who basically just work in, in, in small groups. But they all of them have this characteristic that they're all pursued in a highly collaborative international, international environment. And if you just want to look at some figures, then look at the publication metrics. Now, you know, I always caution against using publication metrics, right? You can, you can prove all sorts of things with statistics, and, and publication metrics are, are no exception to that. 
But if you look at the papers which were published by the physics department in the period from 2008 to 13, that's actually the last ref uh, period, then 75% of those papers have at least one co-author outside the UK and ERA. If you leave out astrophysics and experimental particle physics, which you might imagine are the big boys, right, it just drops to 70%. In fact, if you look at the theoreticians, it's 70%. If you look at my papers, you will see that most of them are written with a couple of other guys. Right? One of them's in Copenhagen, one of them's in Reykjavik. So, so the vast majority of the science that we do, we are working with people not just in the UK but around the globe. If you, again, if you look, take these two out, you actually find that there are 110 institutions worldwide with whom we have co-authored papers during this period. So as science has got, has got to be more and more of it, um, the fact that people work together across the planet hasn't really, has in fact not really changed. Right, you know, in, in Europe, in the era of the invention of quantum mechanics, people mainly centred around Germany, but, but in Copenhagen they spent a lot of time travelling between institutions, working with each other in various combinations, learning things from each other. That still happens today. What's changed, of course, is that you fly. Right? But all that does is cut down the transit time. And also, of course, it's much cheaper than it used to be, relatively speaking, to, to travel, but there are many more people doing it. So, what does, the, what does the demography of a modern physics department, in particular this one, look like? Well, to make any kind of sense of this, you, you, I, I, I thought we ought to have a comparator. So I chose as a comparator, um, basically just by doing this, the year 1987, which was two years after I joined the, the academic staff. Uh, I then discovered that actually it was rather a good choice, but that was, that was by accident. Right? So... Um, if, you, if you look at the, uh, compare the permanent staff in 1987 with 2017, then uh, the, the first thing to realise is there are a lot more of us now. Right? In 1987 there were 79, now there are 123. Uh, but the distribution is also quite different. So in 1987, um, that's, the, that's the number of people whose uh, origins are UK or ERA. But if you look at the university, if you look at the university calendar for those times, then most people who got their degrees in Cambridge or, or in Trinity College Dublin had their degrees assimilated into Oxford degrees, so they're all just registered as having MAs and DPhils, Oxon, right? Um, so you can't tell the difference between the UK and ERA. Um, the number of people from countries which are now in the EU, they weren't actually in the EU in 1987. Uh, <coughs> That's two, actually. Right. And uh, other overseas countries is, is, is less than 10. Now, uh, we have about, about 60 people who are from UK origin. Uh, we have 35 who are EU, and just under 30 or other overseas. So it's changed completely. Note that that distribution is very similar to the distribution of people I told you on the NKIT collaboration. It doesn't really matter how you, what set of people exactly you choose to measure this now, you get very similar answers. You know, roughly speaking, half of, half of them are, are people of UK origin and the other half are, are people from around the world. And of the people from around the world, about half of them are from the EU. Um, there's some other interesting things about it. In 1987, um, the staff of non-UK EU origin, that's... Uh, this lot here, okay, we're all anglophone. And, and you know, well, that tells you something which you actually know, which is that the emigres who were driven from the European continent in the 1930s had all retired by that time. Okay. Real piles, of course, were still around, Curti was still around, but they'd retired. Um, and there's another interesting thing, which is that the longest standing member was appointed in 1950. But the next longest standard in 1958, and that's a huge gap. I'm not, I, 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 it would be interesting to investigate what, why, that, why that is, but, but it's a very big gap. Um, the other comment about 1987, I mean, I was around in 1987, but by that time the postdoc community 
was cosmopolitan. People were postdocs and they came from all over the place. So although the, the, the academic staff in, in Oxford Physics in 1987, I think it pretty much reached a sort of maximum of uh, you know, UK origin Anglophone people. But the postdoc community had already changed again to one which is much more like, like the, the, the modern one. It's kind of curious to take a, this is a, taken from the 1987-88 Oxford University calendar. And this is the list of professors in physical sciences. And if you look down the list, you, you see a number of people. There's Ken Allen, who many of you will have known. Uh, Dennis Blackwell, who was a civilian professor of astronomy. Some character called Dalit, who we've been talking about. Uh, Roger Elliott is there. Chris Lydon Smith is there. And there's an asterisk. And before we look at the asterisk, there's also Don Perkins. Okay. And Pat Sanders. So what was the asterisk all about? That's Chris. If you, I hope you probably may have different seeing at the back. <laughs> That's Chris. Okay. Well, you probably can't read it, but what it says is, for as long as he holds appointment as chairman of physics. <laughs> <laughs> so you could be, Chris could probably fill us in on the details. But basically, in 1987, 1988, the Oxford University had made him a professor, but only as long as he was chairman of physics. So what was all that about? Well, this is the sort of thing, of course, you could only happen in Oxford, right? I mean, the idea that you could give somebody a professorship and then take it away from them as soon as they stood down from an administrative, basically administrative role, is, is kind of strange. Um, but of course, in 1986, there were actually five departments doing physics research in, 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 in the university, um, of which theoretical physics led by Piles was, was one. Um, Carrington Laboratory led, led by Bill Mitchell was, a, was an, another. There was atmospheric physics. Um, and and um, there was nuclear physics, and as I mentioned astronomy, didn't I? Yeah. So, and actually, theoretical physics was led by Roger by then, wasn't it? Not by Piles. <laughs> you were yeah. wicked professor. Yeah. Um, we managed to get together to teach the undergraduate degree. So there was only one undergraduate degree. There weren't five undergraduate degrees, uh, but the, the, the research was all split up. And this was the time at which the modern physics department was actually created, because in 1987, 1988, the reason why there was a chairman of physics was that the process of combining them into one big physics department began. And I, I think that that's relevant for, for some of the things we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay. A another thing from the 1987, 1988 calendar, which is quite interesting, uh, somebody who's not been mentioned so far, this is the list of senior research officers, and under nuclear physics, there is a guy called Neil Tanner. So, who well, I'm sure some of you remember, that's, that's, that's Neil, I'm sorry it's a bit dark. So, Neil grew up in Melbourne, he was Australian. Uh, he's very, very well known for the, for the Tanner scheme, which, which was a, a way of giving access to, to, uh, to kids from comprehensive schools long before this became kind of fashionable or a political imperative. Neil was very concerned about admitting people from deprived backgrounds. He, did, he came from a relatively poor background himself. Um, amongst the young, he was known for smoking enormous numbers of cigarettes. Uh, Neil rarely was to be seen without a cigarette in his hand. But somewhat significantly, in the 1990s, he worked on the SNOW experiment, that's the Submarine Neutrino, Sub Neutrino Observatory, and he made essential contributions to the design of the in instrumentation of that experiment. And that experiment it was, was built to detect solar neutrinos, and it's in, the, in a mine in Sudbury, Ontario, um, and it was basically built to, to look for neutrino oscillations. Uh, and that's in fact exactly what it discovered. So neutrino oscillations were discovered by Snow and also by a Japanese experiment. And the Snow spokesperson, together with the Japanese one, won the 2015 Nobel Prize. And Snow itself won the 2016 Breakthrough Prize for the discovery of neutrino oscillations. So Neil Bate, who was an emigre, by any definition, right, made a very significant contribution to that work. And it's actually rather sad that he didn't live to see 
uh, see the, the acknowledgement that the, the work finally, finally received. Okay, moving on. If we look at today, so what, what, how, how are we split up in 2017? Well, uh, if you look at all staff, we, you've already seen these numbers, that, that's the blue ones this time, so home, EU, others. If you look at staff, uh, and, and uh, if you look at staff under 50, those are the, those are the red ones. Okay. So what this of course shows you is, is that the, uh, the distribution of staff under 50 and staff over 50 is really quite different. And of course, the distribution of staff over 50 is very much more characterised by the, the, the numbers that I showed you for 1987, whereas uh, under 50 are much more recent arrivals. If you look at arrivals since 2008, uh, that's the green ones. Yeah. We're now down to actually recruiting uh, you know, only about a third of the people we recruit now are of UK origin. So about th th about thirty percent of the staff are from non-English speaking, non-English first language speaking countries, um, and uh, that's a huge change from 1987. In 1987, two were. Um, the gap has gone away. The longest standing <coughs> member was appointed in 1981. That's actually James Binney. But the next most longest standing was in 1983. And the one after that, which is actually me, was in 1985. So, so uh, uh, there's no sign of this sort of big gap which is present in the 1987 data. Um, the other interesting thing is that the proportion of women has increased. Right? Uh, in, in 1987 it was 5%, it's now up to 16%. And if you look among re more re recent recruits, it, it, it's, it, it's much higher than that. So, so there are many things which have changed in the way that we, uh, we recruit staff over the, last, uh, over the last 30 years or so. So one of the um, challenges of giving this talk was that I realised everybody else got to talk about emigres who, who they could basically say what they liked about because <laughs> they're unfortunately no longer with us. Um, I thought you would like to know just a little bit about a num some of the people who are with us now where they came from, how they got here, and what they, what they are doing here. Um, and uh, so the, the first one I chose was uh, Ramin, and now I'm in really, really delicate territory because I see him down the back of the room. <laughs> um, actually, one of the reasons, I, I, I chose him for two reasons. Um, one is he's a fellow of St. Cross, and, and of course, there's a lot, as you can see, there are an awful lot of people who I could have chosen to talk about, and I had to have some way of making a choice. So one of the things I went for was fellows of, of St. Cross. Um, but you, as, you can see, as you can see from, from, from his sort of uh, you know, biographical timeline, uh, he, he's had quite an interesting journey to get here. Okay. Uh, he, he originates in, in Tehran. Um, he did his early his degrees in, in Iran. I think one of the interesting things about his PhD is that his advisor was Mehran Kader, who is also Iranian. Um, and has a, has a, uh, is a, in a sense an, uh, an emigre, I guess, but an emigre in MIT. Um, uh, and is a famous theoretical physicist by any, by any, any standards. Um, and I, I must say, I've never actually heard the story of how Ramin managed to have Meron as, a, as, a, as an advisor, but I, I would imagine it was because he visited Iran regularly. During that, during that period, but I mean, can put me right in a minute if that's not correct. Um, he was a postdoc in Santa Barbara. He went back to a faculty position in Iran. Then he came to the United Kingdom to Sheffield, and finally ended up in Oxford in 2010 uh, as a professor of theoretical condensed matter physics. Now, um, the other reason why I, I, I chose. Ramin was because he's a, the work that he does is a very good illustration of the things that we do now but that we didn't do 30 or 40 years ago. So uh, he's, very, he's, he's distinguished for his, his work in biological physics 
and, and, and in particular for, for starting to understand this whole, he's one of the originators of the business of what's so-called active matter. So this is how, the, how you can have relatively simple systems whose laws you understand, but which will behave in such a way which it is start, it's starting to mimic the ways in which living matter really behave. Okay? Now, that's very important from the point of view, of course, of actually, well, going back to Frank, I think it was earlier, said, you know, how many electrons do I need before the electrons are conscious rather than just electrons? Yeah? You know, understanding how these assemblages of very large numbers of atoms actually lead to things that we would recognize as life or intelligence or consciousness, you know, this is a serious scientific problem. I don't think this is a problem of philosophy or metaphysics or anything like that. I think it's a science problem. And so the work that Ramin is doing is, is beginning to chip away at the edges of that sort of problem. Trying to understand how you can assemble systems whose behaviour you understand very well, but which nonetheless are starting to display the characteristics of things which kind of look like they're living. Uh, and then, so that's the sort of highfalutin part of it. And then the more lowbrow part of it, of course, is that if you can understand small machines like this and you can build nanomachines to do particular tasks, then that's something which is potentially very important technology. Okay. Um, and you can imagine, you know, different ways, for example, of dealing with health problems, different ways of intervening, you know, in, in the human body to deal with health problems. You know, if you have active machines which can be programmed to do particular sorts of things. And maybe in a hundred years' time, you know, nobody will have open surgery anymore because it just won't be done that way. Or at least not elective open surgery. So, so I, th I think by, by the definition that we've been operating today, Ramin is certainly an emigre. Uh, and he is certainly somebody who is making a huge contribution to the work of the Oxford Physics Department today. Okay. Um, my next example is also a fellow of uh, St. Cross, that's Lausanne. Um, she comes from Israel. She did her BSc and her MSc in Israel. Uh, she moved to Harvard to do her, her PhD. Uh, and then she moved here. Um, firstly as a James Martin Fellow in Physics and in 2011 became an Associate Professor. And the reason why, one of the reasons why she's interesting is the area that she's working in, the one of climate dynamics, is another part of what Oxford Physics does these days, which is crucially global, is clearly important to, to all of us. Um, and, and which once upon a time was a bit on the edges. Oxford Physics has in fact always had the atmospheric physics department, right? The ozone layer was, was first, uh, first studied uh, in, 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 the 19, in, in the 1930s by, by people at Oxford and uh, a guy whose name is Templey of Eight, Dobson. Templey Dobson, 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 thank you. Uh, Dobson set up monitoring stations for, for ozone. Um, but, but uh, you, you know, we've kept it within, within physics and, and, and really the, the point is that there's a lot of rubbish, of course, in the climate debate, right? And, and there's a lot of non-hard science. And I think it's absolutely crucial that we, that we keep hard science involved, involved in, this, in this sort of business. And that things like climate risk and uncertainties of climate predictions, these are things that we have to understand on a hard science basis. These are problems to do with the dynamics of complicated systems. And that's exactly what law works on. Now my final Emmy Gray, um, uh, so, so she, I don't think she's here, uh, but her husband is, um, is Daniela Bortoletto. And this actually brings us full circle. So, so Daniela is Italian, and uh, as you can see, she did her BSc in Pavia. Uh, she moved to, to Syracuse in the United States to do her PhD, and then she moved on to Purdue, where ultimately she became E.M. Purcell Distinguished Professor. And then she had the great wisdom to move here in 2013. Daniela is an experimental particle physicist, and the reason this brings us full circle is because she now leads the Oxford Atlas Group. And uh, 
she's, uh, she, she's a very, you know, a distinguished senior scientist. She's chair of the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory Program Advisory Committee, for example. That's one of the major US national, national laboratories. She has spent her life working on particle physics experiments, most of it actually in recent times on, the C on CMS, which is a sort of comp friendly competitor to, to Atlas, which also, also discovered the Higgs boson. Um, and uh, you know we're delighted to have her back and, and playing a very strong and playing a leading role in taking particle physics, which has been an important part of what Oxford physics has done for a long time, you know, forward over the next couple of couple of decades. So th those are my three emigres that I'm going to te I've tell you just a little bit about. Right? But they're they're re they're reasonably you know they're they're broad they're spread of science they're a spread of origins. They're sort of typical of the academic staff that we have in, in physics now. Uh, so it's time to wrap up. I thought I'd wrap up by asking a number of you know, sort of few questions. I mean, have physicists really been much more mobile in the last 30 years? Not really. Right? As we've heard, people have moved around for a long time. You can move faster. You can move cheaper now. Um, but the fact that it was slow and expensive didn't really stop our forebears. So, so although that's speeded up a bit, it hasn't intrinsically changed. And if, for example, you look at the faculty of major US universities, even in that year of 1987, when basically Oxford was all Brits, right? Uh, if you looked at the faculty in a major US university, you would not have seen that effect. What has changed is Oxford physics. It's changed a very great deal, and I think in a number of fundamental ways. The process which Chris began of building just one big physics department, rather than these things which were very definitely split up, and although and definitely regarded by quite a lot of people as sort of individual fiefdoms which didn't communicate all that much with each other. Right. That's, cha that's changed a great deal. And people who end up here have started all over the world, and vice versa. People who start here now also end up all over the world. So, so Oxford, really, Oxford physics really now is in that pool of departments where you know, best scientists worldwide move between. Now, I hesitate to say anything about our forebears in 1987, but I, I think that, uh, you, 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 you know, I think the numbers tell a story. Um, is the rise of ever bigger science associated with mobility? I think this is an interesting question. People often think that, you, well, you do, you know, Atlas and stuff like that uh, is it, all because travel is so easy and, and, and all the rest of it. And of course, that helps. Um, it would be more difficult without it, that's for sure. Um, but actually, I think it would be impossible without the internet. And, and that's slightly different. Right? Enormous amount of scientific interchange these days takes place over the internet. Right? It's much easier, actually, to go and solve a problem with somebody if you go and sit having coffee together with them. It's more efficient um, from some points of view. Right? Um, but a huge amount of the management of, of, of big science projects, whichever one you look at, is actually conducted over the internet. The thing which would really make them fall over would be if you took the internet away. The other thing, of course, is that the changing demography is not just in big science. Those numbers which I've showed you are, are things which are true across the board. Right? This, is, this is happening in, in every area of science. So I, I don't actually think that this is particular, this is, the, the, the rise of big science is particularly strongly associated with you know, mobility itself. The rise of big science is really driven by science. It's driven by the sorts of questions that we now need to, to answer. Um, is the present an era of emigres? Well, clearly, yes but mainly for scientific opportunity. In, in the 1930s, people were fleeing, for want of a better word, um, you know, a political situation. For the most part, that's not true at the moment. People are, are moving to places where they see scientific opportunity, 
where they see support for the science that they want to do. Okay. But of course that could easily change. And you know, there's a whole different talk I could have given um, you know, about the effects of political turmoil which have happened over the, you know, the last 12 months and what effect that's going to have on science in the future and what effect that's going to happen on have that on you know on this on the department here and in, in other places you know that's a topic which I'm happy to talk about but it's not a topic for, for, for this talk um, but it, you, you, you know I, I think we ignore the possibility at our, our at our peril we have lived it for the last you know 30 40 years in very benign times which have enabled many of us to pursue our scientific goals really we, without much obstruction apart from the things that people always complain about like lack of money and stuff like that but but it has been a very free time for science and science has, has done fantastically well um, so we have been we have been in in a in a very in a very fortunate era i, I hope very much that that will continue thank you very much observation I've made, because I have some contact with economics departments in, in, in London, is that they are now completely, into, they are now completely international mm. in London. So I can go to a seminar where I feel I'm the only native English speaker, almost in the room, where very, everybody comes to me even overseas. So in some areas of academia, process that you describe has actually gone much further. So I think that chimes with your conclusion that it's not big science, because I think this is not, it's not big science. Um, so I, I don't know if, if, as you were saying, worrying about at the end that there are political changes, I mean, it's going to have a, 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 a very big impact on academia in the UK, not just in the physics. Thank you for your very helpful um, address today. Uh, with regard to the future, should the emphasis be more on methodology rather than mobility, but perhaps aided by mobility? in order that in here in Oxford we may achieve the independence of judgment required in for forwarding research and not overlook the importance of ethics as technological and economic advance assist us. Well, ethics is something which, which does actually uh, you know, appear quite a lot now uh, you know, in, in, in research considerations. If you go to the if you go to the NKIP website, um, you, you will see that there, there is a section of that program which is, which is concerned about the ethical issues of having quantum computers. And, 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 and the, the reason for that is the potential of quantum computers for, for, for basically for code breaking, right? And, and, and you know, stealing information and, and invasion of people's privacy and things like that. So, um, I, I think that uh, you, you know, in all, ma all major universities, Oxford University is no, is no exception. You know, there is an ethics committee. There, there is, uh, you know, a whole slew of things uh, where you need an ethics permission um, to conduct your, conduct your research, and that that applies to some research which is done in the physics department. Uh, you know, anything things involved, involving living cells and, and so on, generally speaking, require ethics ethics permission. Um, I mean, I think that, but science is about methodology, right? I mean, that's what science is, yeah, and, and that's what that's that's what we do when we do science. Well, I thought that needed to be the greater emphasis for independence, which we've always flourished in here in Oxford, to get the independence, which is the um, methodological approaches that will give us precision, but without overlooking ethics. Um, what do you 
starting uh, your Oxford branch in France? <laughs> um, the, you, the, the, that's, that's, a, that's a misreported non-fact. <laughs> <laughs> so so it, it, the, 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 the Oxford University actually issued a, a, a formal denial of that. That's definitely in the realm of alternative truth. <laughs> Quantum mechanics is a theory of alternative facts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Um, I said this morning I was an Oxford physicist of the 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, tell me, are there photographs taken of the whole Clarendon laboratory these days? In, I have one dated 1962. Uh, there are about 250 people on it, yeah. and it's labelled Clarence Laboratory. Uh, on the back, there are the names of everyone present, which is, uh, you know, makes it quite a historic uh, photograph. It's framed, and I'm giving it to the department, the present department, when you finish building the, yes. the new... Yes, for which thank you very much. Yes. yes. But, uh, uh, yes, yes, we do take photographs. I mean, we can't anymore take we can't take photographs of the whole physics department. Like, there are five hundred and thirty people who currently work in the physics department. Oh. Yeah. So, so, um, but, but uh, I think you saw earlier somebody had a photograph of, of theoretical physics from two thousand and sixteen. Somebody showed that this morning. That was Frank. Um, and uh, we, we do we do regularly take take photographs, but not of everybody all at once. Right, well, this one is in 1962. Yeah. There's at least 250 people on it. Uh, I'm, I can remember, well, it, they're, they're all named, which helped me remember them fairly well. It, but it's something you could analyze for the number of any today who are on that picture, 1962, to compare it with 1987. Uh, there were quite a lot, quite a lot. Yeah, I think I, I, mean, I think if you went back, if you were, you know, if you just went back to it, would probably easier to work, go back to the University of Canada, which simply lists these people. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if you went back to the University of Canada of, of you know around about 1960, uh, you, you know, then Curtis would be on there. Um, you know, many people would be on there. But by 1987, of course, they would have retired. Yeah. I'm on the physics web pages, uh, if you go to the different uh, sub departments, and each of them has a has a set of photographs and names of people under all the different categories. So perhaps what you should be do could do is to download those things every year, and uh, that can be recorded. Well, if there there are no more questions.